to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, wow, though he may die, he shall live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. Quartet will be here one more night tomorrow night. Thank you for allowing us to minister in song. Philippians 3.10 That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship, we don't like this part, of his suffering being conformed to his image or his death. Tonight I'm preaching in the name of Jesus on a simple subject, human beings. Human beings in the name of Jesus. You may be seated. God bless you. I have so been thrilled to see Brother and Sister Boyd back ministering tonight. Give them a hand. Many, many, many years. Great musical talents, leadership in this district in the music. And Sister Boyd has a great deal to do with impacting me with this message tonight. It might be the strangest week I've ever lived. July the 1st, a few days ago, was my birthday. I picked up the paper that day in bold headlines in my city in San Diego. The San Diego Tribune said, James Larson killed instantly in a head-on collision. I just stared at it. He was a Swede from St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, he was 70 years old, and thank God it wasn't me. I uh, haven't hurt my back in 10 years, but I absolutely wrenched it hours later. Talked to brother and sister Boyd. She had a bad wreck. She wrenched her back. And then her precious nephew died, John Ragsdale. A twin lady in our church, her twin sister, dropped dead of a heart attack. Her funeral is going to be in a day or so, and my co-pastor is going to be preaching the funeral. It's made me think about a few things in seeing my own name in the headlines dead. And then Grace Larson wrote me on Facebook. That's my mother's name. She's long gone, but Grace Larson wrote me on Facebook. There's too many strange things going on. The Lord's trying to say something. I don't think there's ever a time in church or in human affairs in general that all of us, saint and sinner, boys and girls, young and old, men and women, we feel a sense of commonality that on the occasion of the loss of a loved one, a family member, someone dear to us, and we know that Jesus Christ represents the spotless lamb, and we know that there are varied responses in life, but the one common experience that everybody has is your loved ones are going to die someday, and you, my friend, are going to die. And it doesn't matter how many people are gathered around you and love you and care for you. When it's all over, you're going to meet God face to face, and it's all going to be you and God. The record's going to stand. The tree falls as she lies. This one experience is common to all. Sister Boyd just came from John Ragsdale's grave. Brother Mangan just passed away a few hours ago. It makes us consider the most seminal questions in existence of a human being. We can't help it. We look at death and we really don't understand it. Nobody here really understands it. It's a mystery. It's attached to loss. It's attached to finality. And uh, in thinking about it, there's two things I want to talk about tonight. When Jesus died, of course, there was all kinds of people. They had all kinds of ideas about his death on the cross and you sit here today like many, some sit in unbelief, some sit with opinions or lack thereof. But I want to tell you the 12 disciples that followed Jesus were in staggering loss and they were on ad edge with a, with a rage in their spirit and a raw fiber in their soul 
over what had been taken from them. A day of loss and thinking about it makes us think about life and things that we push away all the time when we like to laugh and have fun and so forth. But we're in a 50-year camp meeting, and the Lord's going to use his word to talk to us tonight. And I'm going to take the advantage now and talk about some questions because there's questions every human being has in your personal life when it comes to eternity. I came on a plane into Denver, the worst flight in 25 years. I really did think we were going to crash. It turned sideways. It almost stopped. The plane was groaning. It was a horrible storm. Just a few hours ago when I landed in Denver, I did not think I was coming to this camp meeting, and I thought the paper was trying to tell me something. But everybody in your own personal being, you can't get away from it. A lot of you here tonight have thought about, boy, I wouldn't want to go down in a jet. Some of you have thought, what would it be like for me to die with a heart attack, rolling over in a car in front of a big semi, going down for the last time in a lake and drowning, serious surgery about to take place and my chest opened up, thousands of things we can focus on. But I want you to think about something right now. I want you to look at the word and hear it real carefully. Human being. I want it to sink into your mind for a moment. It only implies consciousness in the presence. Karen Hardy was riding in the car, and she's traveled so far today, and she was so tired. She said, you know, I don't even think I'm in my conscience here. Am I really here? Am I really in Wisconsin? Did I really make it? And sometimes you can be sitting in church or sitting somewhere, and your mind starts talking to you, and you wonder about your consciousness because... The human being it's talking about implies here it's not was, it's not will be, it's being. It's conscious being. You see, there's no longer a human if you just have a being. There's something that takes place. We live life in nanoseconds and increments of time and we're presently in a conscious state. But just this week, I read about people, a tree fell on their car in a tornado and they died instantly. Mothers and dads and kids and Cub Scouts sleeping next to a river in their tent and they were washed away. They went to bed happy and having fun and the next moment they're drowned. Their conscious being is gone. The flood took them. A 26-year-old hiker on Mount Everest died a couple of weeks ago. 26 years old. He froze to death. When you die, and you will die, I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you will immediately be transferred by the creator of heaven and earth to another location. You have no control over it. You have no idea what's going on in your life at that time. But the greatest fear that every human being has is not death. The greatest fear is not death. It's losing your being. What do you mean, Brother Larson? Plainly, you don't want to become detached from your body. Everybody's here tonight. Thank God we're here. Thank God we're healthy. Nobody's dying right now. Nobody's having a heart attack or a stroke. We're in the house of the Lord. Aren't you glad to be alive? Yeah. Six feet above the ground's a good day. I want to live tomorrow and hear you teach. Had to go to the airport runs today. Didn't get to hear you. But bless God, clap the, your hands to the Lord because you're alive right now. Clap your hands because you're alive. Clap your hands because you can do it. You're a human being. The greatest fear of people is not death. It's being detached from your being. That's why folks are scared to death about this new thing going around called dementia. The fear of sanity going into insanity. The fear of dementia going into Alzheimer's. You don't know who you are anymore. You can't remember where you put your keys and you don't know what your wife's name is. My, my, my. Alzheimer's, it's taking the country. I had an aunt right here from Cochrane, Wisconsin. Her name was, it was Norma Hammergren. And she got into dementia. I went to see her. It was too late. I kissed her and said, good to see you. And she went like this to me. 
And she did that for hours. My wife knows that she did that for hours. There was no communication. Losing your memory. Losing your thinking uh, faculties. and No muscle power. No mind working. It makes men cringe. And then men make statues of themselves, Brother Bill Kennedy. I tell you what, you go out to where we live, Hollywood sidewalk. They got stars on the sidewalk. And you got Marilyn. She'll always be young and blonde. And you got Elvis. Thank you very much. And he's, he's always going to be young. Hallelujah. And, and you've got these different icons. Michael Jackson, I'm bad, I'm bad. And, and they're forever young. Now, I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota. That's where I was born. They tell me they've got a new baseball stadium. I, I had a cousin send me an article about it. And it's called the Target Center. And it's billions of dollars. And my cousin thought I'd enjoy the article, so sent me the thing, and I was looking at it, and they built these statues all around it of these icons when I was a kid. A lot of you never heard of them, but there's this one guy named Harmon Killaroo, big old muscles, and Tony Oliva, and Rod Carew, and, and Kirby Puckett, and they had these statues out there. And when they showed the men unveiling their statues, Brother Grant, I looked at them and I said, What happened? Their big muscles turned into little wormy things. They had got bald and old and gray and bent over and holding canes. The surefire thing of life that is a fact is life is moving on right now from a beginning of your life to an ultimate consummation. And we have a spiritual special reason to be here tonight. We have believers here tonight. We have unbelievers here tonight. We've got backsliders here tonight. We've got nashers and refuters and deniers. I thank God for America. I thank God for that flag up there. I thank God for every man and woman that shed their blood for us to have freedom on this campground for 50 years. Would you clap your hands for our, our, our brave young men in the military? But when you look at that flag, I want to tell you, America is a place that you can have your freedom and your choice. You can be a Christian tonight, and if you want to go to hell, you can go to hell. It's your choice. You can do whatever you want. You don't want to believe in God? Fine. You want to follow the Antichrist? Fine. You want to take the mark of the beast? Fine. You've got a right to believe what you want to and be wrong. But here on this sacred ground, Brother Manuel Rogers, where this flag still flies, and this preacher still leads this district, and this man used to lead this district, and brothers and sisters sat up here tonight to start home missions churches. This is a place where we believe the Bible is the infallible word of God. We believe in one God, and his name is Jesus. We believe you've got to repent of your sins, and you've got to be baptized in Jesus' name to receive the Holy Ghost, and God is going to fill you. Would you thank God for the Holy Ghost in fire? This is God's infallible word. I would suggest to you, if you do not believe the Bible tonight, it's not a badge to wear like some sense of honor or a badge of honor. It doesn't indicate you're highly educated. It doesn't mean you're smart. You might be from Yale or Harvard and you don't believe the Bible tonight. They once were theological schools, did you know that? I want to say tonight that there's no other book on this earth like the Bible. There's no book that has more answers. There's no book that has more emotional standpoints and spiritual standpoints and, and intellectual standpoints. There's no history book like the Bible. There's nothing like the Word of God. There's nothing relatively close to it on the planet earth. The closest thing maybe to it, if you went back 700 years, is Homer and Iliad, which goes back 3,500 years, and there's documentation by the thousands and thousands, but there's no literature like the Holy Word of God. I suggest to everybody here tonight, I suggest to everybody in Wisconsin, I suggest to everybody in the government, don't denigrate the Bible, just hear it and believe it. You're a human being. You're going to need it. My God in heaven, we were taking up offerings today. That was beautiful service. Thank God for our foreign missionaries. My heart was touched. 
If I would have had $1 million in my pocket, I would have wrote it. That's how I felt today. Hallelujah to God. That's how you feel. It was so beautiful. And I didn't look around, but somebody was talking too loud. They must have an earring aid or something. And they were sitting behind me, and they were talking too loud. I didn't look. I don't know who they are. I don't know what their face looks like. So I am not intimidated because I don't know who I'm preaching to. And the man of God was asking for money for missions. And one lady said, you know, every time I come to this campground, they're always asking for money. And the other one said, yeah, last year they raised a million dollars. They always want money. Well, I want to tell you something. Have you ever heard of Marlboro? All they want is your money. And they're going to give you a cowboy hat and cancer of your guts and cancer of your lungs. And have you ever heard of Coors beer or Schmidt beer? All they want is your money. And they're going to end up making you a drunkard and destroying your liver and ruining your life. Have you ever heard of cocaine? Have you ever heard of heroin? All they want is your money. Have you ever heard of a pimp? All he wants is your money. And they're going to leave you with a smell and a stain of sin that will destroy you the rest of your life. But when you give it to God for mission, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Press down. Shake it together. Run it over. If you're having problems with your pocketbook, give to a home missionary. Give to a man of God. And watch the Lord bless you. Because God blesses human beings. Be that it may, Americans are not what God is. I heard the man say it. God is not an American. When man was started, he wasn't an American. He was made in the image of God. Adam and Eve were made in perfectness. They were without sin. They came from the hand of the Creator. And by transgression and disobedience, by deception, they lost their perfectness. How far was that fall? man fell somewhere tonight there is a gap because you're a human being of where you are right now and where God intended you to be there is a gap you and I exist and part of my responsibility as a God called preacher in Wisconsin is to tell you what the Bible teaches and the Bible teaches that you and I exist and in a state of not what essentially we should be, and we cannot just close the gap. You can't just retake the chasm. You cannot cross a bridge. There is no way to get there. There's no road. There's no map. After billions and billions of people have been born on this planet and have no hope, there's no hope to get back to the original state that we were as Adam. When you were born... You were born a sinner, and I'm going to tell you, a Hall of Fame sinner. You were born bad. You were born full of iniquity. It came from your mother's womb. So the message of the Bible in this service is to understand the meaning today of a human being because the Bible says there is a second man and there is always a second Adam. The Bible calls him the last Adam, the first Adam and Eve, messed up the second Adam fixed up Jesus made the way back for you and I to get to essential humanity to get in the presence of God yeah. Acts 17 18 would you put it on there for me because when Jesus made that opening for us the word being continues I guess they don't have it hallelujah Acts 17 praise God it says the certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said to Paul, what will this babbler say? Others said, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus. Jesus is the gap. Jesus is what keeps the being going. Ephesians 1 mentions this phrase 11 times that we who are in Christ. 
Those that don't know the last Adam that have rejected Jesus Christ are going to be lost eternally. And if you didn't know Christ, you're still an Adam. But according to Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, put it up behind me. The inheritance you get from Jesus Christ, the inheritance you will get, hallelujah, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life for a human being through Jesus Christ our Lord. Clap your hands unto the Lord. Grace Larson wrote me this week, but my mother's dead. The thing about death is there is a separation. You can't believe it when your loved one dies. My sister Jeannie, closest to me in age, died of an aneurysm in one night. One month after my dad, John Arvid, a couple of weeks before David Gray, I had all kinds of death around me. And the separation, you can't talk to them. You can't get them on the phone. You can't get a hold of them. And it's so difficult to go through the biblical word of separation. But the Bible says the second death or the second level of death is such a separation. It's a separation of, of body and soul and spirit. So why do we even have an Easter Sunday in our churches? It's because it's the rebuilding of the bridge. It's the reconnecting hallelujah of a hopeless human being to a resurrection of those who are in Jesus Christ and it doesn't matter if you accept this fact or not you are caught up in it unless you obey Acts 238 you will be lost which brings us to the church 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 you know those idiots out there those fanatics they went out there and started at seven o'clock they had all kinds of singing mosquitoes fighting and gnats and flies and they're sweating and it's human. They're crazy. They're a bunch of fanatics, a bunch of emotion. That's all it is. And that preacher guy, who does he think he is? They're all a bunch of hypocrites. I don't need church. They just want your money. I told you what God thinks of that. No sense to go to church so much. Why do you got to have so much preaching? Why do you got to have so much teaching? Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, died personally for every sinner in this building. Personally for every sinner. He took your place on Calvary. That's exactly why we're in this service. Because he who is infinite came to us who are finite and, and we can avoid the second death by being born again of the water of the Spirit. That's why it's so good. It's so good to receive the Holy Ghost. It's so wonderful to be baptized in Jesus' name. Oh, I'm trying to reach you tonight because one of these days you're going to be all alone you and God and when you die that's it you're a human being you're in the hands of God for eternity on, say praise the, Lord. praise the Lord this is not hyperbole it's not dramatization the Bible talks about no temporary loss it's the total separation of body soul and spirit you're no longer a being. There's a damnation. There's eternal hopelessness. Why am I telling you this? Because the Bible says it has to be done. It's my job. It's my calling. Jesus repeated three times, three times something about the second death. Three times when Jesus did it three times, and yet very few he did three times. It's important. He said, if you go out of this world and you are not in Christ, you will go to a place where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. There is a real hell. People go to it, over 15,000 people every day go to a burning hell. It's important, folks, how you leave this world. There's no funny business here. You've got to be right with Jesus Christ. I respect it. You don't believe it, but it doesn't change it. You're not going to get out of it. Some of God's promises are not conditional. It doesn't matter whether you believe them or not. They're real. They're absolute. Clap your hands to the Lord. Praise God. I'm giving you the greatest opportunity of your life. I've seen... 
Many dozens and dozens of people die. I watched people die speaking in tongues. I watched people die crying. I watched people die laughing. I watched people die silently. I watched many, many types of deaths. And when people die, their spirit goes back to God. Sometimes you have so much human being in you, you cannot see the miraculous angelic forces and the spirit world that comes down into the room and why Sister Magruder just in days of not moving and speaking suddenly opened up her head and eyes and raised her head and raised her hands towards heaven and she smiled real big. What did she see? She's no longer being. She is in the presence of the angels. In closing, I think about people like my grandfather, A.D. Urshan, who when he died in Bay City, Texas, in a hospital there, he had such a hand of God upon him, the nurses who were sometimes brutal and long years of service had seen everything, openly wept, openly cried, even laid their heads on his body and said, never have we had anybody like this in our hospital. They sensed the presence of a human being that went to be with his God. I was in Stockton for school a few years ago, and it was a very hot day in the summer. I stayed that summer after Bible school. You get 105, 110 there. I remember that the traffic hour had come and folks were rushing home, and it was just gridlock everywhere. You couldn't get, any, get anywhere, but there were two Marines in a Datsun that was silver, and they were apparently high, drunk, and they were moving in inside the traffic and just jerking in, jerking out, trying to pass. So they were driving like maniacs. And suddenly they had to pull into the lane and the people in front of them hit their brakes too fast to the chain reaction. They had to hit their brakes and the big semi was behind them and the semi come roaring up on the back of that Datsun and crunched the whole back of it. In doing that, it put pressure on the frame and it bent the doors. And it caused the gasoline to pop out. And instantly, there was a ball of fire. Everybody was in shock what to do. Voluminous black smoke. And two young men were screaming, screaming, trying to get out and couldn't get out. That big truck driver went up to that window, smashed that window with his adrenaline. He pulled those young men out. And when he did, they had sat on such a hot seat, the coils in the seat, the back of their jeans were completely burned off and their flesh had been broiled like they were on a grill. They were running in shock and screaming and running and everybody was trying to help them and tackle them and put them down where we could get them some first aid. I'll never forget this. It leaves you forever with an impact. They were dying and burning and screaming out to God and calling him every four letter word in the human language. And those two young men died. Human beings. I made a vow that day. God, when my time comes, I want to die speaking in tongues. I want to die praising God. I want to die full of the Holy Ghost. I want to die ready to meet the Lord. You're here tonight in a conscious state. You're here tonight with a strong human will. I don't know why the Lord picked this message as a heavy message on this Tuesday night. But I'm asking people across this audience... While you've got a conscience and you've got the strength and you can do it with your own volition, would you stand to your feet? Would you stand to your feet?
And maybe you're saved and you're ready to go right now, but you have a brother or a mother or a sister or a dad or a cousin or a nephew that's going to hell right now. This church needs to get a hold of something tonight. If some travail could begin to come across, we're in the middle of this camp and there's going to be some spectacular things happen in the nights to come. But I feel tonight the Lord wants his church to come forward. Hallelujah. He wants you to come and get a hold of the horns of the altar. Somebody needs to pray. The Bible says to repent of your sins and be baptized in Jesus' name. You've been so good to respond every night. Will you respond for somebody else? Would you come and pray for a lost person? Would you bow your head and close your eyes and say, Lord, I have a loved one that I want to see get stirred. I have a loved one I want to see get saved. I have a loved one I want to see get born again. I have a backslider in my house. I have a son or daughter that's wayward. Would you come and begin to grab the horns of the altar? I'm coming to you in my consciousness. I'm coming to you in my right mind. I'm coming to you with a burden. I'm coming to you all salty and sweaty. in the name of Jesus. Lord, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Tonight. 